Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Thank you for joining us uh, to this lesson we continue from the book of Matthew. Uh, we are currently uh, teaching a series from the book of Matthew. It is a large gospel and there is much to learn and there is much to teach. Currently we're on lesson 18. Uh, its title is Jesus Heals, Ministers and Calls for Workers. This picture in the background shows a picture of Jesus and there is a woman bent over at his feet and so this is part of this scripture with one of the uh, miracles that he performs uh, for this woman. Now we have more than one woman in tonight's teaching because we have a child as well who's actually passed away who is asked to be um, resurrected if you will and so Jesus has this ministry where he ministers to all people and it's uh, depicted in a synagogue. So of course this tells us that a synagogue was not just a place for the men, but it's also a place for the women. And that's because it was a essentially a community centre. It's a place where the local community went and they would teach and they would come together and all of society would come there for a variety of purposes together. Now in the previous uh, lesson from Matthew 9. So we're going to be teaching from the second half of Matthew 9. In Matthew 9 there's six components of the scripture. So we covered off three of those in the previous lesson between verses 1 to 17. And Matthew taught us about a paralyzed man who was healed and forgiven, about his own call from being the tax collector for the Romans to becoming a disciple of Jesus. And we also learned about the difference between the old and the new covenant when Jesus was questioned about fasting. Now in this lesson, as I said, there's also three components. So we're going to be reading between verses 18 and 38. And we'll first learn about how Jesus heals a sick woman. And you could say he heals a dead girl. That's kind of how they say it. But in fact, he obviously raised her from the dead. And then we're going to learn how Jesus heals the blind and the mute before finally learning about how he travels and preaches through many synagogues only to tell his disciples that whilst the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. And this is something for us to pay attention to today. So let's begin. So if you can open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9 verses 18 to 19. And we will read about a synagogue leader who asked Jesus to heal his daughter. And it reads, while he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Now some of these people talk, some sort of biblical versions actually mention a ruler of the Jews. And so um, in this particular version it defines who that um, leader is if you will and uh, it's actually a leader of the synagogue now you may notice here that matthew says that the synagogue leader knelt before jesus and jesus we find in verse 19 it says he got up and went with him tells us that he was sitting down in the synagogue now even if you were teaching in the synagogue people used to sit down and so it wasn't like today where the preacher would be up on a stage standing up traipsing up and down they would actually sit down they would have the scrolls and they would simply read the word of god to people and so jesus was sitting down when the synagogue leader came and knelt before him now in this time kneeling before person was actually considered a form of worship because you only got down on your knees before something if you worshipped it. So it's an acknowledgement that if a person knelt before what was perceived as a god, so they used to do it through all the ancient world. Um, people today go to temples of all sorts of different beliefs and they get down on their knees and pray to these idols today. But in this situation, because the synagogue leader got down on his knees and knelt before Jesus, Jesus, of course, certainly was and is the only true God in existence. Now, if Jesus was not God, then this action would actually have been deemed blasphemous. 
which of course in these times would have been punished by death. So you can read in other instances in the New Testament where worship is offered to a human in Acts 10 verses 25 to 26 and also in Revelation 22 to 8 and 9 verse 8 and 9 we hear about worship potentially to an angel. And what does Jesus tell us to do? He tells us actually in the book of Matthew that we don't worship or pray to anybody else apart from the Father. So it's always immediately refused. Now the synagogue leader says, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Now this leader did the right thing in coming to Jesus, but his faith is questionable here because it's small in comparison with the centurion that we read about in Matthew 8. And why is that? Because he felt that it was necessary that Jesus had to physically go and physically put his hand on his daughter. Whereas the centurion's faith was so great, he just said, I know that if you command it, that my uh, employee, as it was, a servant, uh, would actually be healed. So you could say that his faith was bigger or stronger than this particular uh, leader. Now, following this interaction, we're going to read Matthew 9 again, verses 20 to 22, because this fellow asked Jesus to come with him and people got up but before they left the synagogue another event happens and in this one we learn about a woman who was healed by her faith and again we have this belief about touching Jesus or touching something of Jesus and it reads just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. So take notice of that. She said to herself. Now Jesus turned and saw her. So he was obviously aware of her, even though she didn't want him to notice. And he said, take heart, daughter. He said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 5, and the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 8, they actually give a much fuller account of this particular miracle, because Matthew's viewpoint is a little bit different. Matthew has a very legalistic sense, and he wants to document these miracles, but he doesn't put as much of a body of information or story around them. Now, Matthew's account is, however, enough to show the compassion of Jesus, and the fact that his power was not something that was magical, as people would proclaim. Now here we simply see the power of God responding to the faith of those who seek him. Because this woman's condition was embarrassing to her, and this is the issue here. And because, why partially? Because in these days she would be deemed ceremonially unclean. And she would also be condemned for touching Jesus or even being in a pressing crowd. So she wanted to do this in secret. Hence, she goes up behind him, she touches his robes, she speaks to herself, but she doesn't ask Jesus himself. So it gives us a bit of a picture of what's going on. So she would not openly ask Jesus to be healed. Instead, she says to herself, or she thinks to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Now it's prudent to understand that there is no promise that touching the garment or anything else of Jesus will bring healing. It seems that the woman believes this in what may be perceived as a superstitious way. And there's a lot of superstition mixed in with our faith. Yet even though her faith had elements of error or superstition, she still believes in the healing power of Jesus and his garment serves as a point of contact for her faith. So there are many things that we can find wrong with this woman's faith. Yet her faith was actually in Jesus at the end of the day. And the object of faith is much more important than the quality or the quantity of faith. Now this has a bigger picture attached to this because we often talk about the church and about the right way and the wrong way of doing things in church in all sorts of doctrine and dogma and in terms of our, our actual, uh, what we call it, our ceremonies that we perform within the church or rituals or traditions. However, this didn't become a barrier between her and Jesus. And so I do believe that when we say you have to be at this or that in terms of denomination, that that is irrelevant to Jesus.
And in this world today, we have something like 392,000 denominations. And so if that were so, there is a huge roster of people who are never going to meet the Lord. And so I think that this is uh, nonsense. And this scripture demonstrates to us that even though she thought she needed to touch the robe, Jesus still healed her because his, her faith was in him at the end of the day. Now, noting that she did this in a way that didn't draw any attention even from Jesus, you can almost think that she thought healing perhaps went from him unconsciously. In other words, he didn't actually know about it. All she had to do was to touch the robe. In verse 22, Matthew states that Jesus says, and this is the answer to all of this, your faith has healed you. Her faith, although imperfect in its own way, was enough to receive what Jesus wanted to give to her. Her 12 years of bleeding was immediately cured. Even though the woman sought not to draw attention to herself by speaking to herself and touching the cloak of Jesus from behind, when Jesus saw her, of course, he spoke to her publicly. And so you might wonder why did he do this if he knew she was there and why she acted in that way that she did. So let's take a look at some reasons for why Jesus would have done this. So the first one, he did it so that she would know that she was healed in an official declaration from Jesus. You are healed. So she can get up and walk away knowing fully that she is in fact healed. He also did it so that others would know that she was healed because her ailment was private in nature. In other words, she didn't want to declare her ailment, so they might have thought it was odd that uh, she went for healing and they didn't know that there was anything wrong with her. Third one, he did it so she would know why she was healed. Because it was by her faith, not by the superstitious touch, and he declares it that it's by your faith that you were healed. She would not think she had stolen the blessing from Jesus and therefore never feel she would need to hide from him. So if she saw Jesus again and she did something to get something that he didn't know about, she might feel uncomfortable being in his presence again in the future. Another one, he did it so that the synagogue leader would see the power of him at work and therefore have more faith himself for his ill daughter because this still hasn't occurred yet at this point in time. And another one is he did it so he could bless her in a special way, giving her an honoured title that we never see Jesus give to anyone else in the Bible and that title he calls her his daughter. And so it's a very privileged title that he gives her. So as often when we read the scripture, there's quite a lot that goes on and there's quite a lot that we can think about for why these things happen. Okay, so let's now read Matthew chapter 9, verse 23 to 26. And in this portion of scripture, we're going to hear how Jesus, despite being scorned, raises this little girl of the synagogue's leader from the dead. And it reads, when Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. So this is the scorn. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread through all of that region. Now the pipe players and the noisy crowd, you might think, who are they or how do they get in this person's house? It's a bit unusual, you've got a dead girl in the house and you've got a crowd of people in there and people playing music. But the fact is, is that they're probably paid mourners. In the custom of the day, they would offer an ostentatious display of mourning for a price, rather than out of sincere sorrow. When we notice how quickly they move from wailing to ridiculing Jesus, it actually shows their lack of sincerity. Now in the Mishnah, um, we have a, a reading. Now the Mishnah is the, the writing of the oral laws of the Jewish people. And it says, professional mourners were hired even by the poorest families, and I quote, not less than two flutes and one wailing woman was the standard. So mourning, like everything else in this time, had become a system. It had been reduced to a process or a system, a public display. So we get a sense of why 
these, this information was included in the scripture. In verse 25, it says, After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. We learn all the way through the time of Jesus' ministry, he's often kicking people out and putting them outside. And you sort of see those who are actually insincere or who are coming against him, he has no time for them. So he doesn't try to convince them like we would today. He doesn't try to appease them. He just literally kicks them out. And so something for us to sort of think about when we're actually ministering to people. Now Jesus endures the scorn from this crowd. Matthew says that they laughed at him and then he raised the girl to life. So what do we learn? He didn't let the mocking crowd keep him from doing God's will. And his simple act of mercy and compassion brought relief to the grieving father and demonstrated to many people the divine power that Jesus wielded over death itself. So this is still very new, obviously, in this community. Obviously, death can't defeat Jesus. In the next portion of Matthew's account, in verses 27 to 31 from chapter 9, Jesus continues to heal, but this time he heals two blind men. And it reads, As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him. Does that not make you think just at that point? Two blind men followed Jesus. How do two blind men follow somebody on foot amongst the crowd? And they call out, and they say, have mercy on us. But what do they say? They say, son of David. Now, when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them, do you believe I am able to do this? So we find from this, they were able to follow him and go into an actual house. And they say, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. So once again, we have this message about faith. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly. See that no one knows about this. Now this isn't the first time this has happened. Where Jesus has performed the miraculous healing. And he instructs not to let anyone else know about it. But the scripture tells us of course. But they went out and spread the news about him. All over that region. So they didn't just go out and tell a couple of mates. They went out and told the whole region. Now you can imagine it's not easy for blind men to follow Jesus. But they did. So what would they have to do? They would have had to ask others where Jesus was going as they're behind him. And they would have had to listen to every sound that might guide them in the direction that they needed. Despite this, they were obviously clearly determined to follow him. Now in these times, blindness is actually a very common disease in the region. And when we read the scriptures in the time of Jesus' ministry, we hear about blindness all the time. Now, it came partly from the glare of the sun, no sunglasses in these days, on unprotected eyes, and partly because people knew nothing of the importance of, literally, of cleanliness and hygiene. In particular, clouds of unclean flies would literally carry infections which led to the loss of sight. So the two blind men followed Jesus and shouted, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now the significance of this is that this is an open recognition that Jesus is the Messiah. Because Son of David is actually a Messianic title and they asked for the best thing they could and that was mercy. When we go to Matthew chapter 1 and we look at the genealogy, what does it tell us? It tells us Jesus the son of David, the son of Abraham. So God called Abraham out to make a people of his own. Then it goes to King David. Then it goes to Jesus. And so here we see this being used by these two blind men. And of course they asked for the best thing that they could. And that was actually for mercy. Now they're blind. So why would they actually ask for mercy? It's their sole appeal. They don't say anything else. So there's no talk about merit. No pleading of the past sufferings or their persevering endeavours, or their resolves for the future, but simply they say, have mercy on us. So when we look at that, we might think, well, why would they actually say that? It is a confession of sin. Have mercy on us. They want to be cured of their blindness, but they first have to 
confess their sin and have faith in Jesus to be healed. And so they ask or they plead for mercy. The John 9, chapter 9, verse 22 tells us that Pharisees judged anyone who proclaimed Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, and they would be removed from a synagogue. Though the occasion in John seems to have been after this healing of the blind men, we can still understand that there was a price to pay for calling Jesus the son of David. So once the blind men had followed Jesus indoors, Jesus heals them in response to their faith. So faith obviously does not guarantee healing for everybody. Yet there are undoubtedly multitudes that are not healed because they lack faith. Because Jesus says that if you're going to be healed, then faith is the component that you need. So these men simply proclaim their faith by saying, yes, Lord, in agreement to him. Now, the scripture says, according to your faith, let it be done to you. So here again, Matthew emphasizes the proper faith that people should have in Jesus and the blessings that come to men and women through that faith. Now, some examples, the leper of Matthew chapter 8 verses 1 to 4 showed faith because he absolutely knew that Jesus was able to heal his leprosy. The centurion in Matthew chapter 8 verses 5 to 13 had such great faith that Jesus openly praised it as great faith that he had not found among the people of Israel. The disciples failed in faith when in the storm of the sea of Galilee, Matthew chapter 8 again, verses 23 to 27, and here in chapter 9, verses 18 to 26, the woman with the issue of bleeding was healed by her faith. So faith is always the primary element. Now in many ways, God says the same to men and women today. And we should listen to this. According to your faith, let it be done to you. There is much to have by faith and much that is never received because it is never grasped with faith. The faith of these two blind men is worthy of notice because they had the faith, first of all, to follow Jesus, even though they couldn't see. Then they had the faith to cry out, willing to put words to their desire. Then they had faith to make some noise and not to be afraid of embarrassment. They had the faith to identify Jesus, and this is huge, as the son of David, recognizing him as the Messiah. They had the faith to ask Jesus for mercy, knowing that they didn't deserve healing. They had to have faith to believe that Jesus was actually able to heal them. And finally, they had to have the faith to say, yes, Lord, in agreement. So once healed, as we've read earlier in the book of Matthew, Jesus says, see that no one knows about this. But despite the warning of Jesus, they can't resist telling others. Though we do not admire their well-intentioned disobedience, we perhaps might admire their excitement over the work of God. You can imagine if something happened, we want to run around and proclaim what we had witnessed or what happened to ourselves. Now, funnily enough, this was their only area of unbelief. They didn't have the faith to obey Jesus as they should have. All right. So let's now go to Matthew 9, verse 32 to 34, to hear how a mute man is healed. So we hear all the way through the second half of this chapter about healing after healing after healing. And it reads, While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisee said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. And so we have to understand a few things here. First of all, it says a man who was mute and demon possessed. Now in the Jewish understanding of demon possession, this man cannot be helped. This is because most rabbis of the day thought that the essential first step in exorcism was to compel or trick the demon into telling them its name. The name was then thought of as a handle by which the demon could then be removed. Therefore, a demon that made a man mute had cleverly prevented the revelation of the name of the demon inhabiting the victim and therefore preventing its exorcism. 
And so they would deem a man who was demon-possessed and mute as someone who could not be helped. Yet Jesus, of course, had no problem. The demon was cast out and the mute spoke. Verse 33 says, It was never seen like this in Israel. For these reasons, this miracle was particularly amazing to the multitudes. It showed not only the complete authority of Jesus over the demonic realm, but also the weakness of the rabbi's traditions. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So by attributing this work of Jesus to the power of Satan, we see in this gospel the Pharisees and other religious leaders continuing their rejection of Jesus and his work, and obviously his identity as the Messiah. Now in the last portion of chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, we learn about the compassion of Jesus for the multitudes. But there is an issue that needs to be addressed. So it reads, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now it opens up by saying, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. So as Jesus encountered the depth of human need, he had compassion on them. Jesus was not unfeeling or stoic in the face of people and their problem. Verse 35 shows us that what happened in Matthew chapter 8 and 9, though mostly located in Capernaum, because this is where Jesus was residing, was an example of what Jesus obviously did all over the region of the Galilee. In the previous verses, Jesus was terribly and unfairly criticised, and yet we learnt that it did not make him stop his work. He didn't say, oh, they're saying terrible things about me, what can I do, how can I make them stop? He just simply ignored the terrible and unfair criticism, and he got about his father's business. Now the word which is used for moved with compassion in Greek it is actually the strongest word for pity. I will do my best to pronounce it. It's called splagnistheus. And this word describes the compassion which moves a man to the deepest depths of his being. So it's a very strong word. Now it says that the people were harassed and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus here describes how mankind is apart from God that we are like sheep having no shepherd. This means that we are in a lot of trouble until we come under the care of our shepherd. Now this troubled our Saviour more than their bodily bondage to the Romans for these people. And sadly, one could say that the Jewish people of the day did indeed have some kind of spiritual guides and shepherds. Unfortunately, they were the scribes, the priests, the Levites, and the Pharisees that we read about, the Sadducees, and unfortunately, as Jesus goes against all of these groups of teachers, they are pretty much worthless. And so they've led their flock astray. Now, the state of things suggests two pictures to the mind of Jesus. First is a neglected flock of sheep, which he expresses. And the second is a harvest going to waste because there's a lack of those two harvests. There's the lack of work, workers to reap the harvest. They both imply not only a pitiful plight of the Jewish people, but a blameworthy neglect of duty on the part of their religious guides. The Pharisaic comments on the Capernaum Mission Festival in verse 11 were sufficient to justify the adverse judgment. So in verse 11, which we've just read, I'll just go back to that. Oh, sorry, no, it's in the first half of the lesson, wasn't it? So, have you got um, verse 11 there? Tim, would you like to read that? 9 verse 11. <clears throat> when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat the tax collectors and sinners? That one? Right, yep, thank you. So, basically, they are standing against Jesus in a public forum and they're trying to judge Jesus in front of those people. Now, the harvest 
truly is plentiful, but the workers are few, as the scripture says. So Jesus sees the greatness of human need as an opportunity, as a harvest that was plentiful. A harvest is obviously a good thing, and he says that it was plentiful. But he also says that a harvest needs workers. The good of a, har the good of a harvest is going to go to waste if there's no workers to take advantage and to reap, uh, to, to, to reap the actual harvest and to bring it in to be used or to be fed to people in this, in this analogy. But Jesus warns us that opportunities to meet human need and bring people into his kingdom may actually be wasted simply because of the shortage of workers. People who are not willing to stand up and to go out and do the work. And Jesus describes the workers in his kingdom as workers. So in other words, it's not something that we just do casually or randomly. It's, it's like a job. And it's something that people will work hard at. <coughs> now we have to realise that there are many pretenders right through the eras, all the periods of time. And today we're in the same situation. What we have to be careful of is man-made ministers. People who aren't called by God. Still the fields are encumbered with gentlemen who cannot use the sickle. Still the real ingatherers are few and far between. And so what we need, of course, is the instructive and soul-winning ministries. So something for us all to think about. And we're all collectively asked to be workers. It's not a different role for different people. He says, Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Since the harvest belongs to the Lord of the harvest, we're commanded to pray that he would compel workers to reap his, har his harvest. And so prayer is obviously part of the solution that we pray for people to come and to be workers. Now, so in this chapter that we've read now, uh, in over two lessons, Jesus has actually faced several accusations we find. First of all, he's been accused of blasphemy. He's been accused of low morals. He's been accused of being ungodly. And now we find he's been accused of being in league with the devil himself. And so Matthew has obviously clearly established to us in his book, right from chapter one with the genealogy, that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. And Jesus now, as he begins his ministry and the ministry grows, is actually finding what happens rejection and criticism by the authorities that are already in place people don't like someone new who comes along who usurps their authority and jesus of course did this so these conflicts now as we continue to read through the book of matthew and obviously journey through the ministry of jesus we will find that the conflicts with the religious leaders will of course become more frequent and intense until ultimately the authorities will see him put to death on the cross.